Hi everyone, Assalamualaikum. Welcome back to another virtual lecture. In today's video, we're going to continue from where we left off. In the last video, you learned about the first approach to determine the real GDP equilibrium. So today, we're going to look at the alternative way, the second approach, which is called the leakage and injection approach. But before that, we need to revisit the circular flow of income. Okay, so what is the circular flow of income? Now remember guys, we are still in the situation whereby our economy is private and closed. Private and closed simply means that there's only two parties, households and firms. Okay, so money goes around between these two. Okay, let's look at this diagram in your note. Okay, so these are the two parties. Now households are also known as the resource owner. Okay, what are the four resources, if you can recall? Land, labor, capital, entrepreneurship. So those are the things that we own. Now we provide those resources to the firms. See? So in turn, the firms will pay us for our resources. So this is one cycle. What do we get in turn? Well, if we have our skills and abilities, or in other words, um, our labor resource, we get payment in terms of wages and salaries. If we have entrepreneurship abilities, we we'll get profits or dividends. If we have land, sorry, here, if we have land, we can get rent. If you own capital, you can get interest, okay? So that's one cycle. Now, with the money that we get, okay, we can actually use it to buy goods and services. So that's another cycle. But of course, all of this is assumed to be in an ideal world. In reality, however, there exists some leakages from the cycle. There exists some injections into the cycle, okay? So let's go into that. Leakage is also known as withdrawals. In other words, it is when money somehow leaks out from the cycle. Okay, so what are the examples of leakages? Savings. You know, when we save, money will be taken out from the samples. Okay, income or savings here is basically income that households choose not to spend. Remember, the circular flow of income only focuses on spending. Okay, so whenever we take money out to save, it's a leakage or a withdrawal from the circular flow of income. Another example of leakage is tax. Okay, so tax is basically payment uh, that we make to the government, right? So again, we take money out from the system. Okay, another example of leakage is imports. Why? Because when we import goods and services from abroad, we are paying outside. We are paying to the other country, so money doesn't go into our system. It goes to another country's system. Okay, so these are the examples of leakages. I repeat, savings, taxes, and imports. Okay, what about injections? Injections is the other way around. It happens when money is being pumped into our circular flow. So what are the examples of money being put into the circular flow? One is investment. Okay, money that firms spend, okay, into uh, from financial institutions in order to produce more goods and services. So when investment happens, it's an injection. Another example is government expenditure. When government spends billions, you know, maybe to erect some buildings or to provide public goods, it's a form of injection into the economy. And the third example is exports. Whenever we export goods abroad, we'll get money from other countries. Okay, so anyway, these are basically leakage injection. Right, so now here you can see these are the total leakages total injection. Yeah, what's leakage? When spending goes out of the circular flow. What is injection? When spending goes into the circular flow. Now, let's talk about how to achieve equilibrium when leakage and injection happen. Remember, what is equilibrium? It is when things are stable at balance. Okay? To achieve equilibrium, obviously, total leakages must be exactly equal to total injection. Here, if you noticed, you can actually break down the leakages into individual parts. I is investment. It would be in equilibrium, investment would have to be exactly equal to savings. Okay? Government spending would have to be exactly equal to tax. Exports would have to be exactly equal to imports. Right? So for the rest of the lecture, you can actually just browse through your notes yourself. But this is basically the gist that I need to um, remind you about. So after revisiting the circular flow of income, now we can learn the second approach to determining equilibrium real GDP, which is the leakage injection approach. 
Now this approach is based on two ideas. Okay, one is output is equals to income. And secondly, savings is income that is not consumed. Okay, let's look at the first one. Yeah. The leakage injection approach is based on the idea that outcome equals to income. Now, outcome is basically our production. In an economy, we can produce two things, capital goods and consumer goods. Right? Remember, we are still in the economy that is private and closed. Right? Income here, what do we do with our income? We can either consume... That means making payments, making expenditures, or we can save, right? So why don't we write these four in a somewhat simple equation? Capital goods is basically IG. Consumer goods is C, so it's P C plus IG equals to consumption plus savings. Now these two, we can cancel them out because they're on different sides of the equation. So what do we have left? Okay, IG equals to S, or we can also write it as S equals to IG. Remember, this one looks very familiar. If you look at the previous or the page that I showed just now, this is basically leakage, right? This is leakage. This is injection. In other words, there is a equilibrium. There's an equilibrium from the point of view of leakage and injection, right? So this is basically the situation at equilibrium. So basically, in a private closed economy, at equilibrium GDP, this is what happens. Savings is equals to planned investment. Now, I included an important note here in your lecture notes. Okay, planned investment is not actual investment. In fact, to get actual investment is actually planned investment plus unplanned investment. Okay, so in other words, when we are at equilibrium, actual investment is basically just planned investment. In other words, our unplanned investment has to be zero. So this is the case at equilibrium. Now, to understand this better, we need to look at what happens when there are disequilibrium cases. So for this leakage injection approach, we sketch it this way. We have our horizontal line. This represents S and IG, which is total leakage and injection. And here is our real GDP. Okay. So now, how do we sketch IG? Remember in the last video, we learned about investment schedule. How does it look like? Yes, it's a straight line. Okay, so this is our cross investment or planned investment. Don't confuse it with the investment demand curve, which is downward sloping. All right, so this is our IG. What about S? Savings, if you recall uh, topic four under basic macroeconomic relationship, we learned about the consumption and saving um, functions, right? So remember, S is upward sloping. This is S. Now, at this point, this is equilibrium, right? Because S equals to IG. What it means here is at equilibrium, our unplanned investment is zero. Okay, remember? Right? Actual investment equals to planned investment plus unplanned investment. So obviously, if it's here, right? means our actual investment is exactly equals to our planned investment. Therefore, unplanned investment is zero. This is basically at equilibrium. Maybe I should write that down. At equilibrium. Right, so let's imagine. Okay, I'm using these figures. It's from the textbook. Okay, 470 billion is our equilibrium output level. Okay. So now let's look at two cases of disequilibrium. Okay, the first case of disequilibrium is what if S is less than IG? Oops. Okay, what if S is less than IG? So let's go back to our drawing here. Okay, sorry guys, I'm still finding it hard to adjust the camera and doing the slides, uh, doing the presentation. Okay, all right, so what happens when S is equal uh, less than IG? Where's S? Here. IG is here, so this is when both of them are equal. S is less than IG, it would be here, somewhere here. Right? Here's the S, or savings, here's the IG. So this is the situation, the scenario where savings is less than planned investment. Okay, so in the textbook, they put here as 430. Now what happens here? When S is less than IG, what happens is that we have overspending. Remember, IG is a component of spending, right? So here's the case where we have over 
spending. In other words, our unplanned investment is low, right? Because at equilibrium, our unplanned investment is zero. So if we are below equilibrium, we can say that our unplanned investment is low. Okay, okay. So I've written it down here, unplanned investment is too low. In other words, what happens here? We have underproduction because this is our ideal optimal production in an equilibrium state. So whatever it is that we produce below that is called underproduction. Okay, so this is underproduction. So what happens? How can we go back to equilibrium? Okay, so when we go back to equilibrium, what it means is, in other words here, okay, now we go back to this, this equilibrium case. When IG is more than S, we can see that there's extra investments, right? So these extra investments will actually drive up total output back up to equilibrium. So that is how we go back to equilibrium in this case. Now let's look at the other disequilibrium case when S is uh, more than IG, right? So now let's go back to our diagram here. How do we sketch S is more than IG? Somewhere here, right? So this, at these points here, we have more savings compared to Planned investment. Okay, so in the textbook they used 510 million. That's the figure. So what happens here? When S is more than IG, what we can have or what we have here is underspending. Okay, so we have under spending. Why underspending? Because IG is spending, it's less than the savings, so we have underspending. Okay. Now go back to equilibrium to understand when we are at equilibrium, the unplanned investment is zero. So what happens if you're above equilibrium? We can see that unplanned investment has or is too high, right? So unplanned investment is too high here. That is why we have some sort of overproduction. Okay, so how can we go back to equilibrium? Here, as you can see, we have more savings. So this excess savings will drive uh, total spending down because as we know from the equilibrium, income... Okay, when we have uh, income, right? So it's um, income is equals to consumption plus savings. So when we have more savings, it, consumption will be driven down. Excess savings will drive total spending down, okay? Uh, so GDP will fall and go back to equilibrium. All right, let's go back to this diagram, okay? So here, the straight line is our gross investment. In other words, it's our planned investment. At equilibrium, our planned investment intersects with the savings curve. Okay, so this is where we get S equals to IG. In other words, at equilibrium, our planned investment is actually our actual investment. So if actual investment equals to planned investment, this is what we imply. Unplanned investment is zero. But when we have this equilibrium cases, Either way, we have unplanned investment. In the case of when savings is less than um, planned investment, we can see that our unplanned investment is too low. Lah, okay, because everything under this line is planned investment. So here means we have our unplanned investment is too low. Whereas in the other case of this equilibrium, here we have excess, right? In excess of what our planned investment should be. So this is what it means by our unplanned investment is too high.